Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. We're here for oral argument in case number one, CACV 16-0453 in the matter of the guardianship and of and conservatorship for Bradford D. Lund um, with Michelle Lund and uh, et al. as petitioners and William S. Lund's respondents at police. Council, uh, I remind you that this is being uh, recorded, so if you will please uh, state your names and, and who you represent at the beginning of your arguments. Each side will have 20 minutes. That means uh, appellees have a total of 20 minutes to be divided as you deem appropriate. Um, appellants, you're, you're responsible to watch the clock and reserve as much time as you wish for rebuttal. I would uh, remind you that we have read the briefs. Um, and we have uh, conferenced the case uh, and fairly thoroughly. We're familiar with the issues, and so you'll keep keep that in mind with you, with you in connection with your arguments. Council, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, Brian Dowsher for petitioners Michelle Lund and Kristen Olson, the sisters of Brad Lund. Uh, reserve a little time at the end for argument. Uh, petitioners uh, have persevered through a long case uh, started by their aunt Diane Disney Miller in 2009. They've suffered for it. They've been sued and showered with criticism. They don't want any power for themselves, any authority over Brad or his money. They just want to ensure Brad's freedom from isolation, medication, and surveillance. In short, from systematic abuse, the Lunds, Bill Lund, Brad's father, and Sherry Lund, uh, Bill Lund's new wife, have taken these steps to control Brad so that they can get access to Brad's substantial resources. Brad is a frugal person, but he receives $2 million a year in trust distributions. He has no assets to his name at this time. His significant assets have been moved into esoteric and unsuitable trusts that the record makes clear he does not understand. These trusts are controlled by Bill and Sherry Lund and set up by lawyers they found and hired without much evidence of Brad's involvement. Brad's annual income is spent in far-flung litigation that he does not understand. In short, the wealth left to him by his Disney family has made him a target. The trial court said it understood Brad's shortcomings. These are plain, but felt that Bill and Sherry and Rachel could be deemed trusted advisors. Concluded that the state should not get involved, that Bill, his father, should be allowed to do what he wants to Brad, and that sisters and others should not meddle. That, in our view, is a very limited approach to protecting Arizona's vulnerable citizens. For almost 15 years now, Bill and Sherry and Rachel have served as Brad's de facto guardians. They choose his doctors. They make his medical decisions, including until these courts required the production of medical records after almost two years of litigation, the decision to medicate Brad with an array of psychotropic drugs. The record shows that Brad tried to object to the medication. That summary is at Exhibit 497. To no effect. When Brad would object, often the result was more medication. Bill and Sherry and Rachel received copies of Dr. Duane's medical progress notes on Brad. Brad did not know about this. They were not sent to Brad. Especially of interest is a note at Exhibit 330-189, where in August of 2005, Dr. Duane, for perhaps the only time, spoke on the phone to Brad, and Brad expressed the idea that he did not think he needed provigil. The response to that by Dr. Duane was to report to the parents that Brad's oppositional defiant behavior was getting worse, and to suggest the addition of Risperdal, another drug, to the array of medications to control Brad. Mr. Dalsher, I'm going to interrupt only because you have limited time, and it sounds like you're asking us to reweigh evidence when there's some legal 
issues that you've identified. I, I think it'd be more helpful to focus on those. Okay. The point of laying out this history of the de facto guardianship is that the, the powers that Bill and Sherry and Rachel exercise over Brad are far broader than those that any conservator or guardian in the state would ever be allowed to exercise. A conservator would never be allowed to move assets out of state into an irrevocable trust. A conservator would never be allowed to be the trustee of that trust with ultimate power to decide to whom those assets go. A guardian would not be permitted to medicate a, a ward without significant input from the family and perhaps even disclosure to the court ahead of time, especially a, a patient who prior to 2003 had no history of needing such medications. A but counsel, what, here we are seven years later since this proceeding started, what is the key and you, from your point of view to reversing this case? The key is given that, given the standard review before us, and there may be they may be they may be varied because of the many issues raised. But say abuse of discretion for all intents and purposes, abuse of discretion standard. Why does it, why does you, why are your clients entitled to a new proceeding? If we're focused on a new proceeding, the grounds for that are that ahead of trial, the trial court uh, suppressed all kinds of efforts to. Uh, redeveloped the record following appeal. It ignored five petitions from the GAL for help. And when the GAL asked for that help, it instead discharged that GAL and precluded the GAL from being called as a witness at trial. That's error to then criticize uh, petitioners for lacking sufficient evidence when the GAL cannot be called to testify at the proceeding. Um, it erred by ignoring Brad's prior counsel, Jeff Shumway's noisy withdrawal. The guardianship statutes 5303C uh, expressly ensure that the AIP is entitled to independent counsel. Uh, and what Shumway came to court to say was that he could not function as Brad's lawyer due to interference from Sherry Lund. And that is a clear signal to the court that the court should be concerned at that point about independent counsel. Shumway asked that independent counsel be appointed that the funds to pay for Brad's counsel um, be secured separately from Bill and Sherry's approval. And in, re in response to those requests, the trial court uh, simply uh, shut down Shumway, said, you're no longer counsel. I don't have to pay attention to that. Um, the, the GAL joined in that objection and similarly was rejected. Um, th there's su substantial evidence that the trial court ahead of trial here um, in terminating the GAL, suppressing the GAL, and ignoring the noisy withdrawal, withdrawal, took extraordinary action that left this case simply in the hands of petitioners, which is fine, except that petitioners' requests to update the medical exam and the investigator report were also denied. Petitioners' subpoenas for financial records were quashed. Petitioners' requests that the court enforced the special master orders to compel discovery from the respondents were also denied. The one piece of discovery that the trial court allowed to petitioners was Dr. <coughs> Duane's deposition. It refused to quash that. Uh, in the wake of that order refusing to quash, um, Bill and Sherry took Brad back to Dr. Duane, a doctor he had not seen for four years. And after that, Dr. Duane did not appear for deposition. Uh, we tried to show that he was available, and the court took no action to require his deposition either. So end of the day, we get no uh, pre-trial discovery, which in one sense could be okay because there is a com still a very compelling record of Brad's limitations, of his needs for help, both personal and financial. Uh, but then for the judge at the end of the trial to say, you showed no current evidence. Well, why is that? Every effort we made to update the record was thwarted by the trial judge in this case. Um, that is plain error to both preclude uh, collection of certain evidence and then criticize the party whose burden it is to come forward with proof of that evidence for not having that evidence. That's a surprising and shocking result, right? We don't see courts, they know that they shouldn't do that. You can't both deny access to evidence and then criticize its absence. And yet that's what's happened. Even well, at trial. What evidence would have been presented that was not allowed to be presented? we would have had an updated investigator report 
For instance, uh, Siegelbaum's report from 2011 was flawed in one respect, at least, and that is that he presumed that Bill Lund was telling him the truth when Bill Lund told him that $20 million of assets belonged to Brad, particularly the Bray Lou account. Had Siegelbaum been able to proceed further and update that report, he would have learned from us that, in fact, Bray Lou was an asset that had been contributed to the Charitable Lead Annuity Trust, a trust that Brad absolutely, by its terms, cannot control. He's the one person You weren't able to bring out any of this evidence through cross-examination or otherwise at trial? We were able to, we were able to establish that, um, but Siegelbaum was not able to opine on that, on opine on the meaning. If, if, if someone voluntarily misleads the court investigator, um, then that's something that I think should be, should be weighed heavily in the context of this. A medical examiner. Let's go back to the legal grounds for, for, for why the court, why this would be an abuse of discretion. It's not required by statute, correct? The court wasn't violating, violating a rule or statute to order an update. The court is required to consider a medical exam and an investigative report. If the court deems that insufficient, basically what he's saying in his ruling is you don't have sufficient current evidence of this. So, I mean, you can say that there is one in the record, but then that's fine if he's not going to criticize us for having an insufficient record. But I'm just going back to the statutory scheme contemplates one investigative report and one exam. And Correct. What, and just because the, 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 the nature of the case doesn't change that, right? But it, it might not have, but in the context of a ruling which says at the end of the day, you have insufficient evidence, you presented no current evidence, no current medical evidence, what is a petitioner to do in that context? Um, we were precluded from doing that. We asked for our own exam, denied. We asked that the uh, medical exam be updated, denied. Um, the medical exam is deeply flawed. Um, the examination of Blackwood shows that he's a psychologist. Um, why, he was the third doctor appointed to do this. The second doctor, who was essentially chased from the scene, uh, said that this needs to be done by a neuropsychiatrist, someone who understands the brain and drugs. Psychologists are not licensed to, sell, to dispense drugs, and nor are they trained in the physiology of the brain. And although Blackwood notes that Brad's taking certain medications and has physically detectable brain limitations, he makes no conclusions from that because he's not capable of doing that. Um, Dr. Blackwood was also deeply misled. He, told, he was told by Brad, uh, who was prepared for this examination, that the last time he saw a doctor was Dr. Weinstock. And the evidence instead showed that two doctors had seen Brad, including Dr. Duane, the day before the examination where additional medications, which were not disclosed to Dr. Blackwood, were added to his, re his regime. Perhaps most interestingly in the Blackwood report, Brad reports a negative medical history. Negative medical history. This is a person who, at four weeks old, suffered a strangulated hernia and barely survived, suffered some brain damage, which is shown in MRIs. And he reports to Dr. Blackwood a negative medical history. That is telling us along with a lot of other evidence in this case, that Brad cannot communicate effectively his medical condition. We can also see that lack of ability to communicate in some very remarkable evidence in this case, specifically progress reports. When filled out by Brad, uh, they list some of the medications in misspelled script and no symptoms. When filled out by Bill, by Sherry and Rachel, who are not reliable reporters, we instead see detailed descriptions of things that are wrong with Brad. When Brad is brought to Dr. Duane, who, by the way, is a child neurologist, when he's brought to this person, Bill Lund fills out the rate yourself form and rates Brad at the lowest possible classification in everything except geography, which is a known strength of Brad. Uh, but what we see here is a person who cannot, and we hear Dr. Duane say it, cannot communicate with his doctors. We hear Vicki Condit say it. She goes to even ear cleaning appointments. He can't even express when he's frustrated about the pain he's feeling from an ear cleaning appointment. And what the sisters are here to say is that we need to step in and protect people like this um, with independent help so that they're not medicated. When we see evidence of medication with psychotropic drugs and accompanied by a uninterrupted course of deterioration in their life, um, just on the eve of filing this case, we see the worst episode. Brad is reported being overheard, by the way, through video surveillance in his room, another thing a guardian would never be permitted to do, to say that he might want to find a gun and shoot people. 
In response to this, the family, not Brad, goes to Dr. Duane and triples his Seroquel dose. Brad is not involved in that decision. This case is filed, and magically, we stop hearing about deterioration. And once these medical records are produced, these drugs are removed from Brad. And so what we see is scrutiny is helpful to Brad. Brad needs some oversight to ensure that he is free from things like this, from invasions of his privacy, from surveillance, from copying medical records uh, to his parents, um, from medication, and from, importantly, from isolation. Isolation is a tool that the Lunds have used in every possible way. It's not just petitioners that can't see Brad Lund. It's also the GAL who files petitions saying she can't and he can't see Brad Lund. It's Jeff Shumway who says he can't see his own client. It's, it's, Do, it's Siegelbaum who reports that On the Shumway affidavit, counsel, is that, it's my understanding that those are, either there's one or two, I believe there's two. Were either of those signed by Mr. Shumway? I don't, the first one, the one from the fall of 2015, I believe was signed because it was in support of his motion. The one that was lodged in, after the trial in connection with the objection to the GAL's fees was a draft declaration that was offered to the court by the GAL. So it's like in the what's form of the, an what's offer of proof. What's the legal value of a, well, a draft it's, declaration? It's an offer of proof as to what evidence might be forthcoming from a witness like that, right? A witness testifying against his own client. That's true, but under the law's ethical rules, a client, who, a, an attorney who represents a disabled party has a, the right to come forward when he feels that that party is, is not being represented properly, has an actual ethical duty to come forward. It's not the normal situation where you must maintain your client's confidences. Instead, if you are representing a, a person of diminished capacity and you come into possession of information that suggests they're being mistreated, you actually have the ethical rule, duty under 1.14 to come forward with that. Finally, Shumway did so, and yet he's criticized. And in fact, he too joins the list, which includes judges and special masters, counsel, numerous doctors, um, the petitioners themselves, of people being sued for stepping forward to try to help Brad in these cases. Um, I'd like to reserve my time. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Stephen Kubishevsky representing Bradford Lund. I'm here together this morning with co-counsel Joseph Bush from California. Um, and together we represent Mr. Lund's interests, not only in this case, but in the uh, cases out in California as well. Um, may it please the court. Uh, when we start this case and we look at the pleadings that are presented to the court, we have to get to page 54 before we start arguing on the opening brief submitted by uh, Appellant's counsel. Before we get into anything, um, this starts to suggest even a burden of proof. We're re-arguing the facts in this case. That's not the purpose of this morning's hearing. It's not the purpose of an appeal. The purpose of an appeal is to determine whether or not error was made. So we have, what is the standard of review? When we look at the standard of review in this case, we have two things that come into play. The first is the findings of fact. The standard of review on findings of factors were these findings of fact clearly erroneous. So to determine whether or not these facts are clearly erroneous, because even this morning, as I sit here for the past 17 minutes, 16 point or minutes and four seconds, I'm listening to re-arguing of the facts. This, all these facts were presented at trial. All of these facts were presented to Judge Oberbillig. He made a determination on these facts. All of these facts, when we were talking about uh, Dr. Blackwood uh, being dissuaded, being manipulated, all of those things were presented on cross-examination. And at the end, in the conclusion of Dr. Blackwood's testimony, he said that nothing that you've presented to me this morning would change my opinion back in 2011. So going back all the way up, this case, I uh, would correct your honor on one statement that you made earlier, and you said that we've been at this for seven years. It's eight. So we've been at it even longer than, than you had anticipated. Um, justice delayed is justice denied. It's an old adage in the court. My client's rights, and my client's here as well, Your Honor. My client's rights, his, his privacy, his dignity have been dragged through the mud by the petitioners for the past eight years. He's been subjected to evaluations. He's been subjected to investigations, and those things have been completed. The counsel, let's jump to a sure. couple, a couple of the, some of the legal arguments that, that uh, concern me. The guardian ad litem issue. 
why was it not error for the court to preclude, completely preclude the guardian ad litem from testifying as to what uh, he had seen or witnessed over the, over the prior five years, given that you know there could have been appropriate orders, motion in limine to restrict testimony so that there would no be be no encroachment onto privileged issues. Why couldn't the guardian ad litem testify as to other other observations? Sure. Thank you, Your Honor, for the question. Um, it's a very simple answer: is the guardian ad litem had become a sideshow to the to the case. There's nothing that the guardian ad litem was going to present to the court that had not already been presented. So when we look at what the guardian ad litem's role is in this case and what had happened in the affidavit that's been referenced, Mr. Shumway, as described by counsel, had his noisy withdrawal. It's not a noisy withdrawal. He was basically terminated and then tried to get, get his way back in the case. I don't know what Mr. Shumway's involvement was in other matters, but it's my understanding that he had awful very, very few cases, and he wanted to hold on to this golden goose. This thing had been paying him like an annuity since he'd become involved. My position would be is he was part of the problem in this case. Now, if he goes behind his client's back and fails to preserve his his relationship as best he can under Ethical Rule 1.14 and doesn't preserve a normal attorney-client relationship and gives information to a guardian ad litem that is subversive to what his client has clearly told him, which is he does not want to have a guardian appointed, that brings the guardian ad Item into question as to whether or not they maintain independence or is not colluded with the guard with former counsel in trying to become a permanent fixture in Bradford's life. They had submitted a petition to become um, the the limited conservator for Mr. Lund, my client, going forward. So when you look at what the guardian ad litem had done before Ms. Gray's involvement in the case, the guardian ad litem had filed not one but two motions to be relieved of further responsibility because he didn't believe his services were any, were any further required. He wasn't allowed to withdraw because Judge Myers had, had wanted to keep him involved to kind of filter some money through, which is the money that's currently being held pursuant to this court's order here in Arizona of about $36 million, and it's going to be somewhere around there. Don't quote me on the exact dollar figure, but it's a significant amount of money that's currently being held. And the income from that money was being filtered by Mr. Um, Mr. Boyle to go to my client. It was just the income because he was never given access to the principal. So that was the only role that he had. And then after Mr. Shumway's involvement behind the doors, it becomes a blown up case with Ms. Ms. Gray's involvement to make this something that is no longer at issue. It wasn't what, appropriate for Mr. Shumway to step forward, as, as counsel suggested, according to his ethic, ethical obligation, representing an incapacitated person. Or absolutely. Or alleged. Absolutely. And when you look at how that goes forward, what happens if you have that ethical obligation to step forward? You bring that to the court's attention in the most limited factor possible. And, when the, and keep, again, preserving your relationship that you have with your client. And then the court does something like appoint a guardian ad litem. And guess what? We have a guardian ad litem in this case. That guardian ad litem is the one who's then charged with bringing things to the court's attention that are appropriate or inappropriate with regard to Ms. Lund, Mr. Lund's need for a guardian and conservator, whether he's being manipulated, whether he's being secreted. That's the guardian ad litem's job. Mr. M Mr. Shumway's job at that point sticks with, you have to represent your client as best you can ascertain from your client. Now, we have some nice things in this case, the biggest of which is Mr. Lund, my client, testified. He testified and gave Judge Oberbilling his direct impressions of, about what he felt this case is about. And so I want to read one of the statements that he made because you just have to listen to my client. He says, I've been in the system for six and a half years. This is a time of trial, now we're at eight. Spent over four and a half million dollars in the fight for the freedom of my life. I would like my freedom and my personal freedom and my, my financial freedom back, please. So if you're an attorney and you get instruction from that, like that, that's crystal clear. You have a job. If it's not in his best interest to give him his freedom, and sometimes in guardianship and conservatorship cases, it's not in somebody's best interest to give them their full financial freedom because there's dangers to their finances. It's not in their best interest to give them their personal freedoms because they would be a danger to themselves. So those are the things that need to be proven. My client's entitled to his freedoms. He proved his freedoms by clear and convincing, or that he's entitled to them by clear and convincing evidence according to Judge Oberbelleg. He doesn't have any burden in this case. The burden's clear and convincing evidence as to whether or not there's need for a guardian. So when we look at that first step as to whether or not there's anything that suggests there's clear and convincing evidence that a guardian is warranted, you need two things. You need an investigative report, and you need a physician statement. We have both of those things in this case. 
The physician's statement says he doesn't need a guardian at all. Doesn't need a, a conservator either in the, in the physician's statement's opinion. Um, as long as he takes the advice of his trusted advisors. At the time of trial, those were, what, five years old? They were five years old, correct. So the question, right, well, sure, well, I, I, if I can seem, anticipate. Doesn't it seem like, I mean, it seems like one would want, a trier of fact would want an updated information. Why, 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 wouldn't that, why wouldn't that be an abuse of discretion to not allow those reports to be updated? Justice delayed is justice denied. Here's the simple thing, Judge. Having somebody go through and suffer through an evaluation, we can all raise our hands if we think that's a fun process. It's not. My client didn't have any fun being evaluated by somebody that he didn't choose. This was imposed upon him by the court back in 2011. Dr. Blackwood did his report and submitted his report. So then the question is whether or not we're going to get an updated IME. So let's talk about that here just for a second. Are you going to submit him to, to going back to see Dr. Blackwood? One, he was retired. What's his availability? Nobody knows. Could it have been done? Maybe. But now let's look at when the last, most recent stay in this case was lifted. It was lifted in June of 2015. When did they make their request for an IME? Was it in June? Was it in July? August? September? October? No. November? No. We had to wait till December before they finally made their motion. So now the court has a balancing test and we get Nice simple language because you get a view into Judge Oberbilling's rationale as to why this is not an abuse of discretion. So you don't really have to guess. You just have to listen to what Judge Oberbilling said back on January 21st, 2016, prior to trial. I want you to know on an over, and I'll, I'll quote from it, it's page 32, January 21st, 2016. And that's, this is on the record. I want you all to know on an overall basis, that we are in a unique place in this case. We are two months from trial and I, I am concerned about when I balance everything that everyone's arguing on the various positions. I'm keeping that in mind and I want you all to keep that in mind because it sounds like some of this could cause this case to be extended forever. Justice delayed, this isn't the quote, I'm taking this now, I'm adding to. Justice delayed is justice denied. Further quote. And that's exactly what has happened in this case. There has been no limit on anything. This, there has been no moving it forward to finality, and it just keeps going on and on and on, both here and at the Court of Appeals level, and that needs to stop. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for a stop. So whether or not they actually had proof that they didn't have current information today, they needed to prove their case the day they filed it. They were given every opportunity to have information to prove their case on the day they filed it, and they didn't have it in 2011. They don't have it in 2016 when this case was eventually tried. There's nothing to suggest that my client, because there's three doctors that actually did testify that had direct information about Bradford Lund. You have Dr. Blackwood, who did the evaluation pursuant to a court order. You have Dr. Chung, a treating physician, and Dr. Twain, Dwayne, a longtime treating physician. Doctors Duane and Chung also gave updated information about how Brad's doing. And so when we go to the request for a new trial, Doctors Duane and Dr. Chung actually are permissible people for the court to appoint because my client is established in a relationship with both of those doctors. The statute allows the court to say, well, then these are the doctors that will have testify because they're qualified. Did he do it? No. Does he need to do it? No, because he did everything he needed to do pursuant to the statute to get this case to trial. So you can't have a guardianship unless you have a physician statement that say one is necessary. You don't get to listen to Mr. Dowsher argue how the facts should have been should have been interpreted differently by Dr. Blackwood because he did that on cross-examination. That's what he's held to. And Dr. Blackwood again said, I wouldn't change my opinion. Shifting gears for a second, another, another legal issue. Did the court make a finding that you were appointed in, that you were independent counsel. For I, I don't remember if I was ever specifically identified as independent counsel, but, but Mr. Lund, my client, Bradford Lund, was identified numerous times in the case to have the capacity to go out and hire his own counsel. I was independently hired. Judge, when they make these accusations that I'm not independent counsel, I tell you I've been practicing law for 28 years. Almost 10 of those was on the Superior Court bench. Here's a Maricopa County Superior Court Commissioner. My co-counsel has practiced in California for over 41 years, so we're pushing 70 years of combined 
practice in law. I'm not going to jeopardize my license based on one case. This is a big case, sure, but it's not something I'm going to jeopardize to suggest that I'm not independent. Did I fulfill my obligations under Arizona, the ethical rule 1.14? I say absolutely yes, and I challenge them to present any proof. If there's proof that somebody hasn't fulfilled their obligations, it's Mr. Dousher and, well, I think former counsel for Mr. Dousher. When his client, Michelle Lund, testifies in 2013 that she believes that Bradford Lund has the capacity, he has capacity, and has capacity. Stop you on that point. Sure. I, I don't believe that, that that is in our record. I know that you attach something to your, in your appendices to the answer brief, but we cannot find that in the record. Uh, Judge, I can, I can supplement because that's part of our, our deposition designations that were made at trial level. Please do so. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll get on that then quickly. Um, so uh, regardless, it actually doesn't go to the underlying issues, but my suggestion and why I'm offering it for this purpose is this case should have been dismissed in 2013 if we can prove that up. So who's directing Mr. Dousher and the, the petitioner's side in this case is it more a question than who's directing me. And let me clarify, what, I wasn't trying to you know, cast any aspersion to, to either any counsel here, okay? I'm not trying to, that's not our role. But I was following up because on the independent counsel because I know that the court made a, a finding, a, a pretty explicit finding back in 2011, 10, 11, when Mr. Shumway was appointed, maybe 2009, that he was independent counsel. And the court actually made that finding and asked questions uh, of how he was hired. He submitted a letter to the court. Um, I was just, uh, and so. So I, they're bringing the argument that, sure. that there was no independent counsel appointed for Bradford after. Sure. Nobody ever has asked so. me or examined me as to the circumstances about with which I was hired. I would say that I believe that I am independent. I take my direction from nobody but my client, Bradford Lund. It's very clear. And when you look at his testimony, he makes it easy to understand what his direction is to his counsel. And that's what he's directed me to do is get this thing dismissed. And that's what I've attempted to do since I've been involved. Um, Judge, I had promised my co-counsel that I would save uh, six minutes for her. I'm already outside of my time, and I need to give her an opportunity to speak, unless you have further questions for me. Questions? No. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Sandy Slayton and I uh, represent William Sherry and Rachel Shemitz Lund. And um, I'm just gonna take a brief amount of time uh, just to deal with some issues. Could you pull that mic down just, just a bit more? Thank you. Just to deal with some issues that, that the court has expressed questions on. First of all, there was a hearing September 28th 2015, where everything about the Shumway withdrawal and the independent counsel and everything was voiced right in front of Judge Oberbilling. Um, so Judge Oberbilling made specific findings about what he thought vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Jeff Shumway. And he said to Jeff Shumway, this is your opportunity to, to speak, this is the hearing. And, um, uh, and, and he found, I mean, Jeff Shumway was fired and he wouldn't get off the case. Even though he was fired, he wouldn't even leave the courtroom. Judge Oberbilling had to tell him to leave. Um, there was no, this court can search the, uh, the pretrial statements here, um, uh, which is our pretrial statement is index uh, 12, index of record 1283, and petitioner's pretrial statement is 1265. There was nothing in the in, in opposing counsel pretrial statement which announced that it w wanted to uh, call Jeff Shumway as a witness. He wasn't, he wasn't even listed. And keep in mind, Judge Oberbilling hadn't ruled that Jeff Shumway absolutely could not testify. He had ruled that he was bothered by it, that he was concerned about it, and that he was not likely to have people testify in the case who had confidential relationships with Bradford Lund. And so 
they never they never even listed him as to Joe Boyle and they never listed the independent counsel issue as a legal issue at trial as well. Um, they were put on notice of the Jeff Shumway um, quote, and I'm quoting, noisy withdrawal, as they say, from July 2015 onward, when there was a hearing in front of Judge Myers. And Jeff Shumway stood up in front of Judge Myers and asked to present an ex parte um, uh, meeting with uh, Judge Klein. Unprecedented. Um, let me talk about the GAL for a moment. <coughs> This is in the record, Your Honors. It's in our brief. We have <clears throat> Bradford Lund's lawyer, who had been representing him for six years at the time, who had filed all the way to the federal district court, and that's part of the record, and in a habeas proceeding, uh, to argue to the federal district court of Arizona that Bradford Lund had capacity and the state of Arizona was holding him hostage. This is a pleading that Jeff Shumway signed. Um, Jeff Shumway came before this court and pro may have even, uh, there were so many things filed that I can't uh, be specific, but he possibly even took it to the Arizona Supreme Court as to why the, um, the petition uh, should be dismissed because his client had capacity. I think we listed about seven different instances and pleadings that Jeff Shumway filed in the trial court and in all the courts of Arizona, representing as an officer of the court that his client had capacity. Bradford Lund all the time believed that Jeff Shumway was uh, representing his fight for freedom. And as Judge Oberbilling said to Jeff Shumway uh, in this uh, September 28th hearing, your past conduct, and I, I don't have the quote, it's in our briefs, your past conduct, I have some problems with that. You've taken other positions. So what does he do, Jeff Shumway? He secretly, I don't say this lightly, he secretly went to the, uh, the guardian ad litem, unprecedented in my entire 38-year career, <clears throat> went to the guardian ad litem behind his client's back and said, look, I want a limited conservatorship, and you, I want you to be the conservator. I'm not making this up, Your Honors. This is in Joe Boyle's affidavit which he filed before Judge Oberbilling. I want you... you happen to know a record number on that? I the Boyle affidavit? don't have it. Um, it's the 1020... It's... Okay, they're finding it, actually. Um, Thank you. And, 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 Your Honors, I mean, if you... You couldn't make this stuff up. And Judge... And then let's talk about why Judge Oberbilling said enough with the guardian ad litem. Can you just imagine? And we're talking about deference to the lower court. Did he abuse his discretion? The judge is entitled, the trial judge is entitled to say what happens in his own courtroom, what witnesses, uh, evidence. Th these are all um, abuse of discretion issues. They're given wide discretion. The court is well familiar with these standards. But let's talk about Joe Boyle. Petitioners represent. Your time is up now. Okay. So. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Thank you, Your Honors. With respect to the GAL, uh, they say the GAL was a sideshow. I, I suggest and commend to you the five petitions the GAL filed between December 2014 and 2015, first stating that Brad didn't understand the California legal lit litigation that was done in his name. Second expressing concerns about the Nevada Trust. Third, asking for an order that the court not allow transfers to the Nevada Trust because Brad didn't understand it. Fourth, reporting to the court that the GAO was refused access to Brad. Fifth, reporting that Bill and Sherry were denying information. And finally, joining the concern about independent counsel. Uh, Mr. Kupicheski said that it is the GAO's role to weigh in in such matters, and in fact, the GAL did weigh in in the petition. This hearing that Mr. Kupicheski references, petitioners were not invited to this hearing. This was a hearing where uh, Mr. Shumway was present, the GAL was present, and counsel for respondents was present. Petitioners were not allowed to the hearing. That's pretty strange. On direct questioning, 
in the limited questioning that we were allowed to present through Judge Oberbilly, Brad made it clear he does not hire his own lawyers. And if you want to see the evidence of interference with lawyers, then I commend to your attention Exhibit 330, page 472. These are part of the Duane records. This is a letter written to Dr. Duane by Sherry Lund immediately after this case is filed, where she is extremely critical of paralegal Michelle Choi, who happens to be an attorney with Arell and Manella. And, and Michelle Choi apparently had the, uh, uh, the courage to ask Brad whether uh, he really wanted her to follow through on a particular transfer of funds, which she apparently felt could be against his interest. And Sherry is there reporting out that there will be some, some to pay for that. Irrella Manella disappears from this case after that. There is strong evidence of control of Brad's counsel throughout this matter. And Mr. Kupicheski, with all due respect, you can't find one time in the record where he cross-examines Dr. Duane for medicating Brad. One time in the record where he raises a question to Bill Lund about his self-interested dealings with his son's money. One time in the record. Instead, what we see is him expressing things like, we can't talk about the first trust where Brad's money disappeared because the statute of limitations has run. That must be the first time a hired lawyer for a party advocates the statute of limitations against his client's interest. Can't be the case that that is independent counsel. That is counsel serving the needs of Bill and Sherry. I, I, I defy you to find one example in the record of a departure from standing side by side with Bill and Sherry on these things. Um, I'd commend to your attention the video deposition testimony of Brad Lund, uh, which is set forth in the record at AA 220. Um, by watching those clips and comparing the testimony that Brad there gives to the answers that are otherwise offered at trial, you see irreconcilable conflicts in the record. Um, Mr. Kubicheski said that Blackwood reaffirmed his testimony. Actually, at the end, the quote is, if all the undisclosed medications and repeated prior cognitive testing that was done to prepare him for this was true, quote, it may invalidate the results, unquote. Blackwood left the stand confused because he had been asked to do this in a vacuum. He's a psychologist. He was not given access to the Siegelbaum report, which probably would have been the most important thing for a psychologist to see. Um, I would say that with respect to Michelle's statements, there are equal statements on the other side of the case. Sherry Lund wrote that Brad was incompetent. These conclusory statements by lay witnesses don't decide this case. It's the underlying evidence that has to be weighed. And in this case, we have Siegelbaum, a lifelong investigator who spent more time on this case than anyone, who concluded that Brad did not understand the medical issues that he faced and could not begin to articulate his assets. And for those reasons, we believe that at least this should be remanded for a further trial with independent counsel. This should be a matter of stipulation to help Brad, not a contested matter. Where this case fell apart was the lack of independent counsel for Brad to acknowledge his true needs, independent of Bill and Sherry's desires. Thank you. Counsel. Thank you both for your arguments uh, this morning. The court will take this matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. We're now adjourned. Thank you.